The storming of the U.S. embassy is so well done. And it's the terror of knowing, you know, you've got thousands of pissed off people trying to get in and the fear. I mean, even amongst Mm. the U.S. Marines, who whilst they may be armed, there's that moment where the sergeant says to his men, if you shoot one of them, we're all dead. Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of the Aspects of History podcast and it's film club time and the movie myself and distinguished director Tim Hewitt have chosen is Argo, directed by Ben Affleck and released in 2012. This is a subject close to both Tim and I. Tim was born in Iran and my in-laws are Iranian. Argo is set in the wake of the Iranian revolution in 1979 when the Shah was overthrown and the Ayatollah took power, ushering in a theocratic regime that rules to this day but which I do hope is teetering and about to fall. The film is based on the operation carried out by the CIA in association with the Canadians to help six embassy staff escape Tehran during the Iran hostage crisis. As you'll hear from both of us today, we're big fans of the film. There will be spoilers, but I don't think these are fatal since it's pretty obvious what happens. We discuss the cast. It's a great ensemble, which keeps Tim happy. Also, we go off on a bit of a Kyle Chandler lovathon, appreciation of Alan Arkin, a disagreement over Marisa Tomei, and our mutual adoration of Iranian cinema. Most importantly, we are in awe of those Iranian women who are risking their lives to stand up to the regime. Coming up on the regular pod, I've got Napoleon's 1812 invasion of Russia, the Renaissance, the Hundred Years' War and the Battle of Cressy, and much, much more. Next up in the film club in April will be the financial crash double bill of The Big Short and Margin Call. It's the 15th anniversary of the event which I believe is the most significant post 9-11 and which has impacted many Western democracies today, including Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. If you like the pod, please rate and review and please do subscribe to get episodes live to your feed. In the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking to Tim Hewitt on Argo. Tim Hewitt, welcome back to the Film Club. And we are now going to be talking about Argo. Yes. Thank you for having me again. Released in 2012. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Released in 2012, directed by Ben Affleck, starring Ben Affleck, as well as Brian Cranston and John Goodman, the great John Goodman, uh, Alan Arkin and... A and a great that, actor, a great actor called Scoop McNary was a brilliant, brilliant Scoop actor. Scoop McNary, fantastic. And also the amazing character actor. And his name is, in, he's in so much stuff. And his name is Kyle Chandler. Kyle Chandler. So it's a fantastic cast. Slightly male dominated. There are, we will, met, we will get to the, the female actors. This film was, it's very interesting, this film. It's set around... Iran, Iran doesn't really appear much in Hollywood. You don't get much of Iran unless it's 300 and mm, which is a long time ago. I'm, I don't want to talk about 300. It upsets me. <laughs> and then the Iranian revolution in particular is, mm. is barely addressed by Hollywood. And so I think for a start, kudos to Affleck for even addressing this. Now I think he did do this because he studied Middle Eastern history at university, I believe. And so this film is set in the winter of 79, 1980. The Iranian Revolution, which took place over through the Iranians under the Shah, it was Mm. not a... Okay, compared to the regime today, the Shah's regime was much, much better. However, he had a Mm. secret police called the Svark. People were disappeared and beaten up and tortured And so I don't think one could by any stretch call the Shah's regime a liberal, a liberal democracy. (laughs) Certainly not. No, but it was, well, it was a very different country back then under the Shah. I mean, it was a very, it was a westernized country. And we uh, should mention that you've got some Iranian heritage, don't you? Yes. My mother is from Iran. We, we, I was born there. We left in 77 so two years before it happened but and i've never been back so i was just under a year when i left 
Uh, so I have no memory of it. But the, yeah, it was a very different country. I mean, my mother would always tell me lots of stuff about what it was like back then and, you know, how much, I mean, she was a, and a beautiful country. And you don't really see, I mean, you, you do sort of see bits of it in the film, but I'm assuming it's a CGI. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of the plane landing in Tehran, but I'm pretty sure that's very much CGI'd. You, you don't think Ben Affleck got clearance by the... I yeah. really don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you I, see the mountains in the background. You see the mountains garage. in the background. But I'm really ashamed to say that I, I I should know this, but I don't actually know where it was filmed, uh, which is very unlike me not to know a little bit of the background of, of a film that I've chosen to... Turkey is where it was filmed. The The revolution, the Shah escaped from iran with a lot of money and and they Mm -hmm. do highlight that in the film i think the the plane struggled to take off because of the amount of gold the shah had had put in the in the plane and then the ayatollah who was in exile in paris returns and he'd been viewed by i think a lot of liberals as a sort of necessary ally to have to Mm -hmm. i think that the the revolution was successful because it involved Mm -hmm. a whole load of different groups parking their differences so as to overthrow the shah but yes and he was uh welcomed back was was it paris he was in yeah the ayatollah was in exile in paris which is where the shah ended up paris Uh, his Um, wife uh he he mm -hmm. he he, i think he went to egypt and had cancer treatment in america but the mullahs the religious elements soon took control of the revolution and the ayatollah became um, the supreme ruler and so his successor Khamenei took Mm -hmm. over from uh, ayatollah Khamenei and they're in in control today and we are seeing we are seeing demonstrations everywhere i thought we can't talk about argo without mentioning what's happening today in iran and i think we're both hugely supportive of the incredible acts of heroism we're seeing if you on, on my um instagram i seem to see huge numbers of brave acts from really uh, incredible women and, yeah. and men and most recently i saw a video of a, a, a iranian police captain used to arrest a woman for not wearing a hijab yeah it's amazing and and you know the support around the world i on i've been seeing on on social media as well the amount of support from celebrities around the world and for for the cause and i mean it's it's quite astonishing thank god the celebrities got involved because we really needed them i know no we did well they are absolutely paramount when it comes to these sorts of things um but we we uh, i mean it's astonishing to see the bravery in the particularly in the women in iran my mum would always tell me, you know, Iranian women really are very, very strong and brave. And, and it's quite amazing how long it's been going on for now, considering one knows what the consequences can be, as we all know. You know, I mean, you know, and the stories with the footballers in the World Cup is quite, quite astonishing. In fact, to the point of, you know, really incredible. Uh, it, it made, it made the England team's demonstrations or, or, cancelled demonstrations mm. utterly pathetic compared. yeah <laughs> i agree uh absolutely right and argo i think really i think argo is an amazing film i think it was it was brilliantly done brilliantly edited i just thought it was a really you know some of the most suspenseful things in uh sequences in modern cinema particularly at the end of the film but l- leading on from what we're saying it really accentuates the the terror behind it and you know if you if you put a foot wrong what the consequences are i mean there are quite a few sequences in the film where whether it's at the airport or whether it's the when they show up at the canadian house and the maid comes to the door uh, comes to the gate and you think oh my lord this is terrifying and and it, I find it really interesting that Ben Affleck tackled it. You mentioned those moments of terror. I mm. would agree with the opening scenes, which is mm. the U.S. embassy, which Being stormed, is so yeah. accurate, so much so that they actually, in the credits of the film, they show the photographs of the embassy. Yes, and happened. it's like, wow, they're so alike. And, and indeed, indeed, the British embassy, I mean, the mm. Americans have never returned. The British no. returned, but are now mm. out again because... The Iranian who, who are the, these demonstrators are stooges of the regime. 
yeah. stormed the British Embassy as well. So, you know... That's was... not in the film, is it? No, no. If, oh, I'm no. just mentioning more recently. But yes, the storming of the US Embassy is so well done. And it's the terror of knowing, you know, you've got thousands of pissed off people trying to get in and the fear i mean even amongst mm. the u.s marines who whilst they may be armed there's that moment where the sergeant says to his men if you shoot one of them we're all dead yes yeah and then but the predominantly students aren't they outside that are that are protesting uh, not not the ones that storm the, I, the I think it's embassy. a mixture i think a mixture mm. i think a lot of them would have been you know uh, religiously motivated there was mm. a you know obviously america's had this long problem america and britain have had this long problem with iran i mean in mm. particular and we've mm. had simon seabag montefiore come on the podcast talk about world history and i asked him mm -hmm. about the coup in iran in 1953 yeah. which is mentioned in the opening credits of the film and the coup is long i mean certainly known in iran as being a british and american plot to overthrow mm. a democratically elected prime minister but seabag's view is that it's a little bit more complicated than that and whilst yes they would have wanted the overthrow of Mossadegh. Mossadegh was much like the, the, the different factions overthrowing the Shah. Mossadegh yeah. was having to deal with so many different factions to keep them happy communists religious mm -hmm. groups as well as his own liberal side, that he couldn't do it. And that's more, maybe more why he fell rather than a coup. Um, but that was Seabag's view. So it's a very interesting one. But yes, that's why America is very unpopular. And then, of course, they're, it's, uh, they're providing sanctuary to the Shah for his cancer treatment. And so mm -hmm. the, the those demonstrators want the Shah back. Yes. Where he end up probably on a crane like a lot. Like of the others. And then, well, in fact, they've said that that's essentially what they wanted to do, was have him brought back, trialled and then executed. The film concentrates on... A lovely piece of... It's not as if they didn't know what the verdict would be when they... <laughs> exactly. Uh, the film obviously concentrates on the, the select few of Americans who get out of the embassy and are housed by the Canadians. And, of course, they can't leave the house. Uh, because they're terrified they're going to be found. Those who storm the American embassy are having all the shredded evidence put back together. I mean, that's an amazing feat in itself. Yeah, and also true. I, I mean, what's interesting, hmm. though, uh, you mentioned, I think this is where we should bring on our first category, which is most inaccurate scene. And you've, you've <laughs> mentioned that there's, is it six? six yes, yeah, six of them. Six American embassy staff are given sanctuary by mm. the Canadians. And you see CIA men walking through offices in Washington, you know, mm. as w walking and talking as they always show in these things. And Brian Cranston saying, well, you know, they went to the Kiwis and they went to the Brits and they were turned down. And that is not true. Affleck, I don't know why he felt it necessary to uh, basically lie because they were mm. given sanctuary albeit mm. briefly and british and the kiwis i think they couldn't provide a long-term solution because no. just, they didn't have the, the, the space my guess is it may have to do with the unfortunately the formula of film of of film in itself that if they were going to be historically accurate then Affleck would have had to have them come at, go to the British embassy. I mean, he could have done it very briefly, I suppose. But I think he was probably just like, get the, keep the pace going, get them out. They've got to be, then they're housed by the Canadians, boom. And then how do we solve it? Oh, I'll just say that the Brits and the Kiwis turn them down. Now, that's, it is quite drastic because that's totally inaccurate. But that's maybe my guess is that it was just um, a way of dealing with the narrative succinctly, economically. Maybe. But then, you know, you don't want to alter history. No. And I think that's why that wins out over the other scene that I didn't, that mm. is in, inaccurate, but you, you give them a pass, which is right at the end. And this is a spoiler mm. alert. They get yeah. out. But that <laughs> tension in the airport is a bit unnecessary because as we mm. know, they weren't questioned in that fashion. It's out. just very good cinema. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. So, so I'm fine yeah. with that, but I'm not fine with him mm. basically making things right. up. But. The scenes with Ben Affleck, he has to now make a movie as cover to get them out. 
He goes to yep. Hollywood and there he meets two of the most brilliantly warm and watchable stars, Alan Arkin and John Goodman. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't really cast it any better. You know, bearing in mind, this is after they've tried to come up with other ways of getting the Canadians out, you know, posing as school teachers, posing farmers, uh, farmers, cycling to Turkey. And yeah. And then they, yes. <laughs> and then of course they come up with the best bad idea that they can, which is to fake a film crew going to Iran as filmmakers, producer, director, photography, director, and that they're on a location scout for a science fiction film because the landscape lends itself to, you know, a very alien, you know, all alien worlds in Star Trek and all of that. They're always basically like the Middle East for some reason, you know, or Tunisia in Star Wars. Uh, nothing's ever like, <laughs> nothing's ever like the prairies or, or Virginia or Surrey. You know, it has to be, no, we were going to Iran to make a, an alien planet. So they, off he goes to Hollywood where they, literally skim read all these scripts that have never been made they've all been rejected and they come across one that's called Argo which is an awful science fiction film that would never be made ever but they basically put up the front that Ben Affleck is one of the producers John Goodman is the design creature design and all that and Arkin Alan Arkin is the director Alan Arkin is you know the quintessential kind of, I suppose, has been bitter Hollywood director. Couldn't give a job about anyone. And so they put this together in the hope of Ben Affleck flying to Iran and convincing them that the crew that he's going to get out so when they come back to the States are the film crew. And that's the premise. And there's there's this great line when... The uh, when Affleck appears in in LA mm. and explains what he wants to do and basically says I want to come to Hollywood I want to mm. fake a movie and pretend it's real Goodman says you've come to the right place you'll because you want to put you want to you want to be a producer and not do anything Is that, yeah, okay you're gonna you're gonna fit right in <laughs> you're more, more associate producer I think yeah an associate producer. And then, it, of course, you, the elephant in the room in this conversation for mm. listeners is the line that when Alan Arkin is trying to bat away some pesky journalist who's asking him what what the story is about. Mm -hmm. And so it's irritating <laughs> him and he's following him around this this um, long room and mm. he then... And he asks, basically doesn't know what it's about. He has no idea, he hasn't <laughs> read it. Here's the clip. What is the title for it? It's the Argo, it's the thing. Like Jason and the Golden Fleece, or what? No, no, it's the ship. It's the, it's the spaceship. It goes, it goes everywhere. It goes all, all throughout space. So it's the Argonaut. No. Well, what does Argo mean? I don't know. You don't know? It means Argo fuck yourself. Which then becomes a sort of signing off greeting to the all the team, not not the ones in Iran, but. John Goodman, Ben Affleck, and Alan Arkin. And so they convincingly put it all together, including storyboards, uh, costume designs. They have a reading. They have a whole read-through, a flamboyant read-through at a table read with people, cast members, obviously cast, real actors cast, in costume, simply to make the publicity believable so that it's a, it's a convincing project for when they go to Iran. I mean, it's quite amazing that it, that it happened this way. It, it's interesting how creative the CIA can get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder you know, how creative in other fields they've been, not yes, just indeed. making fake films, but But it's interesting also that uh, there, is a, th there is a moment in the film where all bets are off because a, an operation is, is, is sprung by mm. the US military, which did happen as well. It was a complete mm -hmm. disaster and two helicopters crashed and a number of lives lost, which was the attempt to, to get the embassy staff out. And added to the fact that this story was never revealed were, I think, quite significant factors as to why Jimmy Carter lost the, the election in the 1980. Election, yeah. 
had this operation been revealed, who knows uh, whether Jimmy Carter would have, um, I don't think, I, I think Reagan won with the landslide. So I think it's unlikely that he would have won. But yeah. Well, when was this revealed? After it was after. Mm. In fact, it was, it wasn't really revealed. It was only the Canadians took all the credit for it. Obviously the CIA couldn't claim any kind of. No. Credit. Not until Ben Affleck comes along. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's it's suspenseful filmmaking at its best. So the, I'm, I'm going to pull in mm. the third cat, uh, the second category, mm. which is the best performance. What, what do we think our best performance is? For me, it's Alan Arkin all day long. It's very difficult to disagree with you. Uh, it's Again, it's one of those, it's an ensemble piece where everyone really is very, I mean, I think Brian Cranston is very good. John Goodman is never not good. The thing is, Alan Arkin is really never not good. I mean, he's always, he, he does have the best lines. What but, are some of the best films he's seen in? Because I've seen him in Catch 22 very Catch 22 good. is one of the best. He's also he's in. in Little Miss Sunshine. Little Miss Sunshine. He's in The Therapist in a great film called Gross Point Blank. Of course. With John Cusack. He plays that kind of sarcastic, dry character very, very well. So, yes, I agree with you. I think this is, I will, I will say that the Iranian guard at the very end in the airport is extremely convincing and terrifying. I would, I would say he's very much runner up. That's he's an American cause... actor. He's an American, but he's so convincing as a, I mean, he is his deadly stare and the way he just probes at them and it's like, oh my God, they're going to get caught. They're going to get caught. And I've heard from other Iranians how accurate that is that you know, some of these, these guys. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no mercy shown. No. And no humor. There is literally no, you cannot even try to just say something slightly humorous or a throwaway line or just smile at them even. It's just, don't, don't even bother, <laughs> you know? Um, so he captures, he, yeah. But Alan, uh, Alan Arkin, yeah, winner. Okay. I, we should make, I mean, the cast is, is fantastic. There mm. are a few, we've already mentioned others I'd like to just mention is Zel- mm. Zelchko Ivanek. He's mm-hmm. always good. Mm-hmm. Got Titus Welliver. He's from Bosch. <laughs> yeah. The main guy in Bosch. Tate Donovan's very good. Clea Duval, she's fantastic in it. Plays the wife of Scoot McNary. Uh, yes, she's excellent. The, the maid is fantastic. She is the lead in an amazing Persian film called The Girl Who Walks Alone, uh, Home Alone at Night, which is a vampire film, but she's excellent in it. That's not the one set during the Iran-Iraq war, is it? No. A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night is what it's called. And it's a great film made by a Persian-American woman. Really good. And she's in this, she plays the mage. Small role in this, but she's very good. Yeah, really good performances all round, really. Even some veteran actors who have a very small role. Yes, I agree. Victor Garber, uh, who's the Canadian, he is a Canadian actor and he's the Canadian who hosts them. It's his house. He's very good. He's always solid. And Ben Affleck's very good in it. I think. Yeah, he is actually. He he sort of. I know we've not really mentioned him. I mean, he, he's done a fantastic job as a director. Mm. Um, he didn't get a nomination for the Oscar, no. even though the film won best film. Yes, but, I mentioned this in our last podcast. I think he he was highly overlooked, and I I'm sure it was an accident. I'm positive it was an accident. They are the Oscars are known for their accidents, aren't they? Reading out the wrong winner. Yeah, reading out the wrong la- uh, the wrong winner. Yeah, that stuff like that. The, giving the, giving the win to crash. Yeah, let, we could go on and on actually, but the Marisa Tomei for my cousin Vinny, I'm sure, was an accident. Oh, um, oh, I'm not having that. I love <laughs> Marisa Tomei. I <laughs> know oh, I love. She's excellent. Well, I'm, then, I'm sure that was what, Oscar worthy day. The, why the, not? The <laughs> this is a this is a tangent. I might have to um, cancel you. <laughs> the you know Al Pacino n- not winning an Oscar until Sense of a Woman is just outrageous, but that's that's Oscar talk. I think you know even even Ben Affleck's seventies hair was very convincing in this. You know he's it's actually a bit unfortunate for him as an actor because he basically plays a blank canvas, not showing much emotion. There's the necessary again. We talked about this in Lincoln 
last time, you know, you've got to have the family scenes with the wife, but, and so you've got to have a little background with his character and his relationship with his wife and son. Really not necessary in terms of what the plot. There's always ha- there always has to be a B story. I'm not entirely sure it was necessary with this, but it's got to round the character out, I suppose. I thought he was very good in it and he cast himself well. I'm very, very keen to see what he's done with his up and coming film Air with, again, he's directing it. He's in it. And this time Matt Damon's playing the lead because they're obviously very good friends in real life. This is about Nikkei. Nikkei. It is. I'm looking forward to it, actually. The film about Michael Jordan's... Michael Jordan's shoe. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we all love a bit Matt Damon. But Kyle Chandler, who Mm -hmm. I I just want to mention again because I'm a big, Mm -hmm. huge fan of his. Big, big fan. Manchester by the Sea. Very good. Good, Great in this TV series. um, Bloodline. With... Yeah, Bloodline. And and I genuinely argue that he's in the best scene in The Wolf of Wall Street when he confronts DiCaprio on the boat. It's the best scene and it's mainly down to his performance. That's interesting. Why do you say that then? Because I know the scene you're talking Mm. about where Mm. he's at DiCaprio playing Jordan Belfort attempts to bribe him. Well, there's a hint that he's going to bribe, but it's Carl Chandler's scheming, his faking and feigning that he's absolutely and utterly there because he just needs to do his job he's totally on DiCaprio's side he's like don't I know I get it I get it and then he turns the wheel and he's so good it basically the scene ends in the complete opposite of the way it began and it's just brilliant and I think his performance is really down to that mainly so I love him and I love him in this as well he's just a great character actor do you know what I'm glad you've mentioned that because and I'm going to provide some more details I guess towards the end but I was thinking about our next two films for the club, which is to talk about the financial crisis of which Wolf of Wall Street is, is a part. No, we are going off on a slight tangent, but it is relevant due to the aspects of History Film Club. But I will, I'm very keen to cover Big Short, directed by Adam McKay, Margin Call. With Spacey and Paul Bettany. Jeremy Irons. And Jeremy Irons, yeah. Yes. Both um, of which cover the financial crisis, which... I think still is not mentioned enough as the most significant. I think it's the most significant event of post 9-11, or maybe you could talk about the invasion of Ukraine. But, you know, I think... Isn't that that for for aspects of history? It is a bit, and I don't think anyone's made any film. We've been mentioning it on the podcast actually often, Mm. but... But I think that the impact of the financial crash has Mm -hmm. had such major ripple effects you know, you can certainly put the election of Trump, Brexit, yeah. all these things as a result of the financial crash, really shaken Western democracies. Right. So uh, Argo. So mm. I've done, we've done best performance. We've done the most inaccurate scene, which is the blame mm. lie about the Kiwis mm. and the British embassy. The legacy of Argo. I think it's quite significant, even though I'm not sure how much it's mentioned nowadays. It's one of the very, very few films that deals with Iran. Yeah. And apart from that, I, with everyone I know who knows the film, if I say Argo, they will respond with Argo, fuck yourself. So it's, you know, just on that alone, the legacy is pretty much more than our last, I think anyway, more than our last film that we were discussing in our last podcast, which was Lincoln. Um, I I feel like Argo came out of nowhere. Even though, you know, it's a big Hollywood production. It's got great cast. It's Ben Affleck from directing it and he's starring in it. But it wasn't something that was on everybody's radar, maybe because of the subject matter, because it's dealing with Iran. I mean, it is really surprising that no one or at least mainstream films aren't dealing with the, with that subject. Do you know um, what? I've just gone hmm. onto my dashboard on my podcast hmm. app to look at if I've got any listeners in Iran now, I right. if, if there are any listeners in Iran, please reach out to me. You can get me on my um, in the show notes. I'm assuming there are loads listening. They've just got very good VPN. Yes. Gosh. OK, but that uh, would be it, interesting to know. But this goes for any listeners at all. If you want to any comments or questions, please get hold mm. of hold of me. The links are in the show notes. And I, I'd be interested to know what, you know, really in detail, what the reaction in Iran was to the film. I mean, I know, you know, there was just a brief mention of it 
on Wikipedia, for example. But it'd be interesting to know what the, what people thought about the, the what was portrayed in the film. You know, apart from this, any. Well, I should imagine it was banned and so wasn't shown. That's really but, what I was getting at. Is uh, it still banned? There is a nice nod in the beginning of the film that mm. I wanted to mention, and I'm, I'm glad I've remembered, is to Marjan Satrapi's graphic novel Persepolis. Persepolis, as mm-hmm. I think I'm probably meant to pronounce it, which mm-hmm. is referred to in the beginning because you see the sort of cartoon opening of the film. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that that was influenced by Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. Brilliant graphical film. Really good film. Yeah. And Ira- Iranian film is very strong. There's the, the divorce. Mm-hmm. You mean the separation? Separation. separation. Yeah. He's an amazing filmmaker. He's made some great films. Before a separation, he made a film called About Ellie, which is an amazing film. And then he made, he's won the Oscar twice for a separation and the, it'll come to me. Um, but uh, Persian f- cinema is amazing. I think it's a really strong. Well, I did um, want to give a shout out to Taxi, which is directed by or written everything by Jafar Panahi, a great Iranian director as well. Taxi Tehran, I think it was is released in Britain. That's what it was called. And I was talking about Ashgar Farhadi, who made A Separation and The Past, and then a film called The Salesman, uh, which was amazing. And then he made a, a film in Spain with Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz called Everybody Knows, which is Penelope Cruz is kidnapped. And it's a really great thriller. So I recommend that as well. All these Iranian films, I'm going to put links into the show notes. And I just want to do another call out mm-hmm. finally for one. Mm-hmm. I think it's Under the Shadow. Oh, wow. The horror film. Yes. Which is yes. set during the Iran-Iraq war. Terrifying. So be warned, listeners. It is a horror film and uh, which deals with a demon, which is it's all very symbolic. You know, it's all about essentially about the regime, what's going on in Iran. And it's disguised as a horror film. If anyone's familiar with a film called a New Zealand film called The Babadook, which is a very strong horror film, it's kind of similar in its style. Yeah, yeah. I would say this is so much better than. But it's it's. I thought Babadook wasn't absolutely very good. amazing. Uh, you didn't like The Babadook? Yeah. I I thought it was very good. Tim, yeah, that's your lot, listeners. Thanks very much, I'm Tim. Thank kidding. you for your time. Thanks so and... much. It's been such fun. And anyone who hasn't seen Argo, please watch Argo. It's, it's amazing, I think. Argo, oh, fuck yourself. Argo, oh, fuck yourself. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry for the swearing there, very childish. Links are in the show notes, including how to get hold of Tim and I if you want to give us your thoughts. Next in the film club, the 2008 financial crash films of The Big Short and Margin Call. Please do rate and review and please tell your friends as well. Next up, Napoleon's Invasion of Russia. Thank you and good night.